All right, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight and week four of our Joshua study. We'll be in chapter five, but it is week four. Clarence, it is not demo day tonight. I'm sorry. We are not knocking down any walls. That was, uh, the water's fine. Come on in, the water's fine. Um, next week will be demo day where we will get to knock down some walls at Jericho. But that'll have to wait till next week. But this week we will get to through chapter 5 and then we will get to talk about a very difficult subject to address. Uh, but before we get into that, who would like to open us up in a word of prayer? If you want to turn the master volume down, Johnny, you can. All right, Daniel, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, who can summarize for us what happened previously on Daniel? What happened last week? On uh, Joshua. Yeah, Daniel's on my mind. Too. Previously on Joshua. What happened last week? We have crossed the Jordan River. So Clarence, how was the water when we crossed it? Little warm, yeah. I mean, flood stage of uh, you know barley harvest season, so water is nice and warm. Piling up at the city of Adam, remember, and of course, the nation was able to cross over. At least the fighting force, um, the nation and the fighting force from Reuben, Gad, Half Manasseh that wanted to go, wanted to go with them or had to go with them. And what is this deal about Gilgal? Remember, I have the pin here, Gilgal? Question mark because it's somewhere in this area. What is now the site of Gilgal? What is that? Yes, exactly. That is the uh, the 12 stones that were taken up out of the Jordan, the stones that had been in the water, taken out now to serve as what? Why these stones? A memorial for how long? Forever in your generations, teach your kids this. When your kids ask, hey, what's the deal with these rocks? You can tell them, hey, here's what God did for us to bring us into the promised land. The land that he has promised us. This land flowing with milk and honey. This is, you can bring them down to Gilgal and tell them, this is what God did. And it was right there, that river we crossed. And how amazing is God to do this for us. And that is how they were supposed to treat that site and the memory of what happened here forever and ever and ever. God was very big on his people teaching successive generations what he had done for them. All right. Correct. So now we're in chapter 5. Chapter the 5th. We are now at Gilgal. We'll just pretend that this pin is Gilgal. And so we will be at our new camp. Joshua's going to use this as his new base of operations for the conquest. And from Gilgal, now that we are in Camp Tier, we can look at Jericho. Ooh, if I zoom out, I'll see our pin again. It's right there. Jericho, Old Testament Jericho, um, we're looking at it, their hearts are melting with fear because of what our God has done to the Egyptians, to Sihon and Og, the Amorite kings, and now we are in chapter 5. Okay. As soon as all the kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan to the west, now we're on the west side, on the east side, Sihon and Og were taken care of. And now all the kings of the Amorites on the west side, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea. What sea? I mean, anytime you hear a reference to the sea in the Bible, it's probably talking about that big one, the Mediterranean Sea. So from the river to the sea, all these Canaanite kings are freaking out. Okay, as well as it, that should be from the river to the sea, all the Canaanites freaking out, and the Amorite kings, because here come Yahweh's people Israel, 
into the land. Okay. When they heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over. He dried up the river just long enough for his people to cross. This is amazing. Their hearts melted. And there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. So you got the Canaanite kings running scared. Their hearts are melted. Oh no, what are we to do to even try to combat these people? You as Joshua, the commander of the army, logistically thinking, militaristically thinking, what do you do now? When your opponent is on their heels, what do you do? Oh, you strike them. That's the perfect time to charge in. Swords waving, guns ablazing, so to speak. Now's the time to wait to go to battle because we got them on the run. This is the perfect time to strike. We certainly don't want to give them any time to regroup and steal themselves. So what do they do? Yeah, what, what do they do? When, humanly speaking, logistically, now's the time to strike. Verse 2. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, For all of your fighting men here, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. Not each man has to be circumcised a second time. That can't really happen. Circumcise the men of the people a second time. When was the first time? Yeah. When they're about ready to get up out of Egypt. So for 40 years, remember what happened in the wilderness wanderings? People under the age of 20 would be able to grow up long enough to take the promised land, and Joshua and Caleb. Everybody else, die off in the wilderness, because you faithless generation wouldn't listen to me. So now you've got to wander around for 40 years. This is the second time the men were circumcised? Is there a problem there? Yeah, it seems to be in the wilderness wanderings, they weren't really keeping up on the symbol of the what covenant? Abrahamic covenant. They should have been observing that the whole time. There shouldn't be any men left needing to be circumcised, but there were. That could be a hint of the faithlessness of the people even during the wilderness wanderings. I'm a Moses guy. It might be too much for me to say, Moses, it's your failure of leadership that you didn't... Uh, but, but hey, you, you know, it's just they weren't really totally observing the Abrahamic covenant like they should have been. So, God wants them to be spiritually ready for this conquest. Remember what I said way back in week one? This mission is much more spiritual than it even is military. Okay. The people need to be prepared. They need to be right before the Lord. They need to be in good standing in their covenant relationship. This transcending even the Mosaic one, the Abrahamic one. You need to be ready spiritually to take this land. You can be the greatest military of all time and wipe out the people and take the land, but then what? Then what are you going to do with it? Remember last week we looked at Deuteronomy 6. And... What was Moses basically telling them? What warning did he give them in Deuteronomy 6? When you come into this move-in ready land with woods furniture left and right and all the best stuff, right? And the, the wells that you didn't dig and the houses that you didn't build, God is saying, when I hook you up with a really good life on earth, be careful to what? Yes, exactly. Be careful when you have all these riches in the world that you don't forget God. That you don't say, well, who is the Lord? I don't need Him anymore. Because Israel, it's your land, it's my land, but it's your land I'm giving you. If you are faithful, you will stay in it forever. Well, not to spoil the rest of the book, but they weren't faithful very often. So eventually they were swept out of the land, 586 B.C. with Nebuchadnezzar. Um, but God is long-suffering and patient and merciful that he gave them even that much time. Anyway, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. 
So basically cripple them and make them not even really fighting able. Yikes. That would have been really stupid logistically if you were just dealing with a human commander. God knows what they need beyond a military. So Joshua made flint, <clears throat> flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeah Ha'aralah, which, which, which is a beautiful Hebrew phrase for, you know, it's going to commemorate what would happen there. It's called the Hill of the Foreskins, basically. Um, and this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them all. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised back then, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. On the eighth day, as these boys are, you know, after they're born, you're supposed to circumcise them as a way of showing identity in the covenant with God as Abraham's people. And they weren't doing that. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The, war, the Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give to us a land flowing with milk and honey. And of course, remember, why was it that the Lord didn't let that generation see the land flowing with milk and honey? Yep, they were not faithful. And how did they show themselves faithless? Exactly. Let's send 12 spies to scout out the land. And when they came back, oh, look at these huge grapevines we found. And, you know, the Nephilim are here. And the, 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 they're strong. And uh, the, the land is great. But, oh, there's no way we could possibly defeat them and, and dislodge them out of this land. And you know what? They were right. Humanly speaking, they would not have been able to do that. But two of the spies... They had the right heart to, basically, I think they were saying, <laughs> you're right, we can't, but God can. Now is our time to go up and take the land. He promised it to us. And those two faithful spies, of course, were our boy Joshua that we're talking about and Caleb that we will meet in a little bit later in the book. So yes, that, of course, is why God said, fine, then your generation will not take it. You're going to die off in the wilderness. That's the book of Numbers. It's God killing off that generation over time through various and sundry you know, things that are going on there to bring the next generation in, along with Joshua and Caleb. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a very, very good question. We'll see that coming into the next few verses here. Um, that's a good question, though. Verse 7, So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. They were failing to show identification with the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. And we could talk another day of why circumcision at all. But... Um, when the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. They're wasting time. Come on, we have the Canaanites on the run here. Why aren't we? It is first and foremost a spiritual mission. So they wait long enough until the men are healed from this. And the Lord said to Joshua, this is really interesting. Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. Now Gilgal already, the name already had significance, and it's translated kind of circle of stones. But now at this place, God gives it even a newer significance, Gilgal, circle. It, it kind of has this connotation of round or circle or rolling. And so he's saying, I'm, now I'm rolling away the reproach of Egypt from you. Quite symbolic. A scene of like a foreskin rolling away, you know. 
but now there's even greater and new significance to this site. God is preparing them spiritually for what they are about to do physically. And the, the name of the place is called Gilgal. He's rolling away the reproach of Egypt from them. Now that you've crossed the river, now that you're really in the promised land, on the right side of the tracks of the promised land, um, you know, because that Jordan River really kind of demarcated kind of what, that, what was considered the promised land. And we've talked about this in the first couple of weeks. You know, here's our 12 tribes map. You do have Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh on this side. And this technically is, you know, promised land. Um, between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, Mediterranean was really kind of considered like, this is our promised land. Oh, and then there's the other side, too. There's the Transjordan, the other side of the Jordan. So now that they've crossed the Jordan and they're like square in the territory of the Canaanites, the people they're supposed to chase out, and we will talk about that in detail soon. Now that they're there past the river, now's the time really to consecrate yourselves, really to take care of this problem that has been lacking for 40 years, to get yourself ready spiritually. And now that they've crossed the Jericho, not only is it time to become circumcised, but we'll also see how rolling away the reproach of Egypt really is God saying, put that in the rear view mirror. That is done. That is in the past. There's a new future for you, which is now going to be the present. There's a new way forward. Focus on this. Rolled away the reproach of Egypt. You're now circumcised. And now we have in verse 10 as well. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, what did they do? Look at this. They ate the produce of the land. They are now in the promised land eating of its produce, and the Jerichoites are watching, like, they're eating our food, you know, this is just, <laughs> now we're really in trouble. Um, more psychological warfare type stuff, we're eating your food. But it was significant because now you are enjoying the produce of the land that I've given to you, unleavened cakes and parched grain, and what just so happened in verse 12? It, yeah. Your wandering is done. You're no longer wanderers. Your home. Manna ceases. Yeah, that was God's miraculous provision for them while they were wanderers. Your home now. Manna's done. Eat. Welcome home. You now get to enjoy the produce of the land. You're now prepared yourself spiritually for the tough physical task that I've given you. Now they're home. Now they need to take it and remove the squatters. Okay? So the manna ceased the day after they ate the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Okay. So, significance there. Great question by Clarence. That's why after they cross the Jordan, these things happen. They're circumcised. They eat the produce of the land. Manna ceases. You're home. You got a problem to take care of while you're home, <laughs> but you're home. And, and, and that is so deeply meaningful. It, I mean, you read through the book of Genesis, as Daniel and I have been doing, and we just finished it today. Um, you read through the book of Genesis, and this Abrahamic covenant is so important. It is so important. Abraham, I will give you a land, a seed, and a blessing. And that land really, I mean, they're all super important, but that land really is so meaningful to them. And as that covenant promise is passed down from one legitimate heir to another, to Isaac, to Jacob, and so on, it's that land, we're home, we, we need a home. And that's why Abraham buys the plot from Ephraim the Hittite for the burial place so he can have a legitimate actual slice of that promised land and that expectation, that promise grows throughout the generations. Bless you. And that's why it was so horrible what they did 
40 years earlier by not obeying God and having the faith to go home. That was awful. Abraham was probably rolling over in his grave for his children to say, no, we can't do it. Oh, no. That's awful. That's why that angered the Lord so much. This is what I've been working for you for all of these generations. And now you would spite me by not taking it? That's why he said to another generation. Um, This land promise was nothing to mess with, as Moses discovered. Um, Okay, so they're on this side of the river. Now, something really fascinating happens. Now, okay, they're healed from their circumcision. They've gotten some good food in their bellies. They're home. Joshua, being the great man he is, now let's do it. Let's go to war. Let's take these cities. This is fascinating in verse 13. Why doesn't somebody read that for us? Verses 13 through 15. All right. Thank you. I love these verses in Scripture. And why are they here? What's going on? As Joshua's by Jericho, now wherever Gilgal is here on the river, it's already by Jericho. But I think it, that might mean that Joshua's kind of doing some scouting of his own. Maybe he's kind of getting up closer to the cities. You know, I want to see with my own two eyes, you know, this place, what's going on. And he's, just, he's by Jericho in some way, shape, or form. And, of course, he looks at a man standing before him with a sword drawn. Now, nobody in Israel was supposed to draw their sword yet. So if this is somebody from Israel, like, okay, dude, you're going to be in trouble. But if this is an enemy, dude, you're going to be in trouble. (laughs) i got to take care of you. So he sees this man with a sword. Oh, are you for us or for them? You know, are you friend or foe? Reveal yourself. Who are you? Are you for us or for our adversaries? And if he was for their adversaries, I'm sure... Joshua was ready to strike him down. And he said, no. It's really interesting. Are you for us or for them? No. Okay. Um, But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Okay. Um, And now I have come. Now, if you're Joshua, what else are you going to do but fall on your face to the earth now, did this person, so Joshua sees him as just a man. He thinks he's a, just a guy with a sword. Now, when this is revealed, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Was there some sort of physical manifestation that, you know, some shiny light or whatever that Joshua couldn't help but to recoil from, which would often be the case if you see an angelic presence. That's why these everybody was filled with fear. and Oh, I have to need to throw myself because you're probably thinking it's God. You've never seen something like that before. That's why Gabriel had to say, do not fear, do not fear. Or he didn't shine a light or anything, and Joshua trusts that what this guy said was true, and just knowing there's a commander of the army of the Lord, he falls to his face and worships. Now, when we see in Scripture the angel of the Lord or an angel of the Lord or something like this, not every time is it a pre-incarnate Christ. Because there are some times where the human would see an angel of the Lord, fall down and worship. And that figure would say, don't worship me. But there are times where the visitor is worshipped and that visitor accepts worship. That usually will be the dead giveaway on if we're dealing with a divine person or not. If the messenger says, oh, don't worship me, clearly that's not God. But if the messenger from the Lord accepts worship, that really could only be a divine person. And so here I do think we have a manifestation of the Son of God that appears before Joshua. Now, theologically speaking, 
Anytime we see God, or he can be seen, and this is even new heavens, new earth, one on the throne. I think this is Isaiah 6, up on the throne. Anytime we glimpse, or somebody has glimpsed, has beheld God, that's the second person of the Trinity. Okay, that is how God can be apprehended or observed in any way, shape, or form by us. That's Jesus. Okay. The Son of God is what we would who we would ever see if we ever behold God. So anytime somebody sees God in Scripture, that's the second person of the Trinity. It's true, nobody can see God and live. That's the Father. You can't see the Father. But Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, so this is a pre-incarnate Christ. This is the Son of God coming down to earth before Joshua. It's interesting, he says, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Just by that statement, we might think, oh, Michael has appeared to him, or some archangel. But Joshua worships. What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army, to jo- his response to Joshua is even more confirming, I think that this is a divine person. Take off your sandals from your feet. For the place where you're standing, because I'm here with you, is holy. Where else have we seen something like that? Moses, burning bush. That was the presence of God. That was the, the Holy Spirit, I think. Probably, technically. Holy ground, Moses, take off your sandals. Joshua, take off your sandals. It's holy ground because you're standing before God. And so he does. So the very Son of God here is standing before Joshua in, res- in response to his question. Are you for us or for them? No. I'm the commander of the Lord's army here. What's the significance of this? With a a sword drawn, why is this happening? Yeah, exactly. It's going to go before them. Okay, Joshua, commander of this army. Who's going to achieve victory? Yeah, you're going to storm the gates, and you're going to knock. You're going to take over the cities. You're going to burn the cities. You're going to defeat these kings, these kings, these kings, and over the next generation, you're going to do great things. You're going to achieve a lot of victory. Who's achieving the victory? This ain't you, Joshua. It, it seems that you know the crossing of the Red Sea was a great manifestation of God's power and glory for the people of Israel. This seems to be something for Joshua alone. All right, Joshua, me and you. Remember the role that Joshua had. What was it? The mediator of the theocratic... I pointed to you because you got it a couple of weeks. Yes, yes. The mediator of the theocratic... uh, The theocratic mediator of that covenant relationship between God and his people. Boom. Joshua, you're the one. You represent the people, and you're the go-between. You're the guy that I've set up, that I've chosen to replace Moses. You're the guy. I think this was for Joshua's benefit, specifically. You need to prepare yourself as well as a leader of these people. So, Joshua, don't get too big for your britches. It's not you that is securing victory. here. And I, I think Joshua probably already got that. But this experience really would have cemented that in his mind. Would have burned it into his retina, so to speak. Joshua, it ain't you. It's me, the commander of the Lord's army. Any thoughts or questions on chapter 5? Joshua's going to be used in a wonderful way. But like any of us, if we are used for God's glory somehow, it's, it's God doing the work. That's right. Daniel, can you make sure everybody gets one of these? I have a handout for you. I don't know. Okay, so now um, we need to address something in order... We have to understand something as we read the rest 
of Joshua and Judges. And I, I figured that this would be the good juncture to talk about that. This is a topic. Uh, remember I've said several times now, how must we inform our view of who God is? Through the Bible, through the Scriptures. If we don't use this objective standard that reveals to us who God is, as God has revealed himself to us in his word, if we don't use that standard, how are we going to think about God? Yeah, he, he's going to be whatever we think he is. We're going to create God in our own image. Oh, I'd like to think that God would do this, or, oh, I can't imagine God would ever, blah, blah, blah. We're defining God. If we don't let the scriptures define who God is, we are the ones doing that. So God is whoever we want him to be. That ain't, that's not a God. That makes me God. So we need to understand who God is as he's revealed himself to us in the scriptures. And uh, I've, I've addressed it already a couple times, but like the big elephant in the room would be in the book of Joshua and Judges, what? Uh, hey, welcome home, Israel. I, I'm giving you a move in ready land, but what's the problem? Oh, there's a bunch of people here. What do we do with these people that are here? Okay, now God prescribes something that must be done with these people here. Okay, and I'll start this conversation by stating this. I have been, I've initiated and have been drawn into several conversations about this very topic. One, by a random person at a pool in South Carolina that, that said, oh, I, I love the Old Testament. You know, we were t I know. talking with him. Hey, what do you do? What do you do? Oh, I love the, he says to me, I love the Old Testament. Oh, I just love God. I'm a Christian. I love the Old Testament. And, and then, of course, right away he says, so what about slaughtering the Canaanite? That's what he asked me. That's pretty much how he asked it. I don't know. So I give him the answer, as I understand it, according to Scripture, and he said, I don't like that one bit. <laughs> and then he said, God would never dot, dot, dot. He was defining who God is. Well, I don't like that. I like God revealing who he is, not people defining who he is. So, um, we will see many references from this point on to devoting to complete destruction. And we must understand what's going on there and why. So this conversation, um, I really only like to ever have with somebody that can agree with me on one thing. In fact, I won't have this conversation unless this can be agreed upon. And then we can talk about it all day long. And that one thing must be, we must agree that God can do whatever he wants with his creation. I think I have the Apostle Paul's support on that. I don't think the clay can say to the potter, what are you doing to me? No, you have no right. If we can agree that God can do whatever he wants with his creation, then we can debate what is going on and what God is doing, right? But let's use the scriptures to define that. So I have a handout, a little reference for you. We'll walk through it. I've given us enough time tonight to have this difficult conversation, which I've, throughout the week, have been wondering, hey, are we going to get some random visitors tonight, first-timers? They're going to come to Valley Grove, and then we'll talk about this, and they'll be like, whoa. Um, we'll be in the scriptures. So, um, what happens here, God does prescribe, and we'll see this as we go, slaughter them all. Livestock, men, women, children. We must understand why God says that. You cannot deny the what. He said it. Although that's people will like to do that. We must understand why. The seed form of this, some of these passages we'll read through in greater detail. Some we'll just talk about. The seed form of this is way back in Genesis 9 with Ham sinning against Noah. 
There are some wild ideas about what's going on here. Ham just dishonors his father by looking upon his nakedness, going out and joking about it probably with his brothers. Shem and Japheth decide to honor their father by walking backwards, covering him up, and getting out of there. Noah realizes, Ham dishonored me. So now I'm going to curse Canaan. Makes sense, right? That might seem odd to us. Canaan is Ham's son, who Canaan's descendants will inhabit this land. Noah probably, it's, God is working this all out, but as far as Noah is concerned, he's probably perceiving something about Canaan um, that prefigured a characteristic of his descendants. And there's more that we could talk about here, but I think Noah probably doesn't want to curse Ham and a third of the world. He probably wants to narrow it down to Canaan. Now, God is, of course, driving this. But I think Noah wants to spare his son from being cursed, and so he's like, I'm going to curse your son, which really to him, that would have been more painful than anything. Okay, so he curses Canaan, that's seed form of this. From this point on, and in fact, that's why that story is included in Genesis 9, from this point on, there's references to, oh, the Canaanites were in the land, the Canaanites were in the land, and Jewish readers would be like, oh, that goes back to him. Basically, the book of Genesis, the first 11 chapters are there, to get us to Abraham. Okay, so what are the first 11 chapters of Genesis? It's interesting. It's the, the creation, Adam and Eve, and all this sort of stuff. What it really cares about is getting us to Abraham. Okay. And then the book of Genesis, what it really cares about is to get us to Moses. To get us to the giving of the law, constituting Israel as a nation. And from that point on, the rest of Scripture really is that. Focused on that. Okay. Um, so that's why that's in Genesis 9. That's the seed form. Here's where it kind of fleshes out. Genesis 15, 16. You can go to that if you want, if you have your Bibles. Genesis 15, 16. Now, God is reiterating the promise to Abraham, establishing that covenant he would have with him. You'll have a land, seed, and a blessing. Um, okay, verse 3. 13, Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, it's Goshen and Egypt, and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. They're going to be homeless for 400 years. Yes, Joseph will hook them up in Goshen, but basically they're homeless. Afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on that nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. That, that happened. As for you, Abram, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they, your descendants, shall come back here in the fourth generation for, it's interesting, for why? The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It's not yet full. Interesting. Uh, Abram, I have a plan for you, and I even have a plan for the people that are here right now. They have not yet, judicially, judicially speaking, they have not yet reached the point where I will bring the earthly consequences onto their great sin. That'll be 400 years from now. It's not time yet. Okay. The sins of the Amorites is not yet complete. Okay. Leviticus 18. Go there. We have to talk about this. Leviticus 18. This is the giving of the law. They're at Mount Sinai now. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I'm bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. 
your system of ethics and morality will not be drawn from the peoples of the world. It will be given to you from me, God is saying. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, member of the covenant community of Israel, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. And now he's, we don't have to read all this. He's going to go on a list of the types of things that are done in the land. And it, it goes on and on. Okay, verse 24. You can read those on your own time. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. Well, why not, God? For by all these, the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. Okay, the people have been very bad. This list that I just gave you, that describes them. Very bad. Don't do that. Don't live that way. I am the Lord. You live by my statutes and rules. That's why I'm driving out all these people. They've become unclean. And, big problem, verse 25, this land that God wants for Abraham and his descendants. And the land became unclean. They're so bad that they basically polluted the land and made it a den of a hive of scum and villainy is what they call it. So that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. They don't deserve to be in this land that I promised to Abraham and his descendants. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules, and do none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. Verse 28 lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the persons who do them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs that were practiced before you, and never to make yourselves unclean by them. And if that's not strong enough, I am the Lord your God. So, Israel, here's the land that you get to have. The people that have been in there have disqualified themselves for 400 plus years. And you know what? I've given them time. I am the Lord your God, God says. The judge of the living and the dead. The creator of all the universe that can do whatever he wants with his creation. I'm going to vomit them out of the land. And you know what? It's your land I'm giving you, so you can do whatever you want. It's not what he says. This is the land I'm giving you so that you will walk in my rules and statutes and not pollute the land. Because if you do, apple of my eye, descendants of Abram, whom I love more than anything, yeah, you're out too. Okay? That's the precedent he's setting for the land. And the Canaanites were so wicked that he has decided judicially they're done. Now, God could have said this about anybody in the world, right? He could have said that the ancient Japanese at this time, he could have said they're so bad, they need to get out of their land. Why didn't he do that to them? Or to the Egyptians? Or to the Hittites? Or to anybody else? The problem is that they were committing this evil in the promised land. That's the problem. This land is polluted by all these people. Okay, so he's going to vomit them out. Right, oh God, okay, we can get behind that. Sure, I get it. Uh, How? How would he vomit them out of the land? Let's go to Deuteronomy 20. And if you have any questions at all, any time or insight to lend, feel free. Because we're just kind of going through some other passages. We're timing out from Joshua here to address this. So that we are prepared to receive the rest of Joshua. Okay. Uh, Moses is preparing the people to go into the land. Remember they're around Shittim at this point. They're still around Shittim. This is before they've crossed the Jordan. This is before Moses has died. And so Moses needs to prepare the people. Give them the law again. Prepare them for how to handle coming into the land. Deuteronomy verse 1, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. 
For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people, shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. Hence Joshua's encounter with Christ. Then the officer shall speak to the people, saying, Is there any man who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. They, they still were concerned about the practical matters of life and taking care of their own. And is there any man who has planted a vineyard and has not enjoyed its fruit? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in battle and another man enjoy its fruit. This is very considerate of God, by the way. I mean, it really is. And is there any man who has betrothed a wife and has not taken her? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. And the officer shall speak further to the people and say, Is there any man who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go back to his house, lest he make the heart of his fellows melt like his own. We don't want that spreading throughout the foxholes. Okay? And when the officers have finished speaking to the people, the commander shall be appointed at the head of the people. Okay. When you draw near to a city to fight against it, and if it responds to you peaceably and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. But if it makes no peace with you, you gave them a chance. But makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall put all its males to the sword, kill all the fighting men. But the women and the little ones, the livestock and everything else in the city, all its spoil, you shall take as plunder for yourselves. And you shall enjoy the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. Okay, so is this, so then why kill Jericho? These instructions are given to Israel. Um, verse 15. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far from you. This is how you're to conduct yourselves in war against cities outside the promised land. Give them a fair shake at peace. If they accept it, great. You can press them into labor if you want. If they fight against you, yeah, you know what? We live in a fallen world. Kill their men of, of battle and then just take the rest. That's what you're to do to cities outside the promised land. And God never commanded them, hey, go conquest, go take over the world. He never told them to wage war and go on a conquest with foreign nations. If you do find yourselves in battle against them, that's how you're supposed to handle yourself. But, verse 16, and here's where we really get into it. But in the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes. But you shall, here's the word, cherem, the Hebrew word, cherem. You shall devote them to complete destruction. The Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, but the Ites, the usual suspects, as the Lord your God has commanded. Why? This is a big mystery of why he would have them do this. If there was only if, if only there was an indication of why he would tell them to devote them to complete destruction and let nothing that breathes left alive. Unfortunately, we're just left to guess. Somebody read verse 18. You can't leave any of that culture remaining. This is complete annihilation of the culture that has polluted my Eliminate it all. If you leave any of them left, what's going to happen? What does a little, little leaven do? It leavens the whole lot. God is not playing around. Now, we also must remember, God, as he's instructing Israel here, is dealing in the context of a fallen world that is critical to understand. If there was no sin in the garden and no fall, there would be no slaughter people. None of that. God works in the context of a fallen world. And whose fault is that? Is that his? 
not for a second. It's ours. Since this is a fallen world, you're all full of sin. Y'all need Jesus. Here's how things must be done. Don't leave any of that culture left alive. Because it's going to drag you down. God seems to deal more swiftly and thoroughly in these stages of infancy for his program. That's Israel and later the church. Why strike down Ananias and Sapphira? What they did was, eh, really? Yeah, that little leaven would have leavened the whole lump. Get them out of it. In the infant stages of Israel and the church, God deals very swiftly and thoroughly, almost to a degree where we're left thinking, wow, isn't that a little harsh? Now, God can do whatever he wants. But it's those two slices of history that he seems to deal more sternly, let's say. Because he doesn't want that creeping up. When you besiege a city for a long time, making war against it in order to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. You may eat from them, but you shall not cut them down. Usually you'd cut down all the wood to prop it against the city to set it on fire. Are the trees in the field human that they should be besieged by you? It's like, leave the trees out of this. You know, it's livestock and it's humans. Only the trees that you know are not trees for food that you may destroy and cut down, that you may build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it falls. So this word harem, devote to complete destruction. Really technically, it's to devote something. There's a positive aspect and negative aspect. Let's flip to the back because the, the, the passages in Joshua and Judges we will cover in detail when we come to them. General observations of how we see the harem work in Scripture. Okay? And we'll see this as examples when we come to them. <clears throat> harem, the command to devote something. Applied to entire family groups of the banned person. Okay? This is all of the Parasites. This is all of the Hittites. This is all of the Amorites. This is their, their whole people group, their whole family. If God designated somebody to be banned is a decent corollary English gloss, if he, if he selected something to be banned, we see that being applied to the person and his family. And his progeny. Because that culture needs to be eradicated. That negative influence needs to be swept away. Okay. Now, as we saw this with Rahab, this was to be total throughout the promised land. But we saw that saving faith in Yahweh apparently exempted the Canaanite. And their family. Remember, Rahab's whole family was welcomed into the covenant community of Israel. We're not even told her family also believed. Rahab did. That was enough. So, harem applies to entire families and people groups. If you are exempted from harem, it also seems to apply to your family and people group. We'll see this play out, too, again. Any violation of harem, I think I might have this here. Yes, the next one. Violating harem. This was a very careful and strict command God placed upon Israel. If anyone would violate it and play around with it and play fast and loose with it, what happened to them? Um, it placed the violator and their family under harem. And Deuteronomy 7 explains this. And their family. This is kind of the squeamish part where people are like, wow, isn't this too harsh from... God is not messing around. I will not let that little leaven into Israel to leaven the whole lump. Y'all got to go. Okay. Now, it's also very important to understand. This harem is an earthly consequence. This is God taking the physical life of somebody when he has deemed it. Remember, this is not a scheme that Moses and Joshua cooked up themselves in the tent one night. Hey, let's start slaughtering people. This is God's command. God is the one that had decided judicially, 
these lives are to be taken. It's an earthly consequence. Theoretically, if you are a believer, this is getting into 1 John 5 stuff, sin leading to death. If you're a believer and God decides, you know what, your life is taken, what happens to your salvation? You never lose it. The Bible is crystal clear on this, people. If you are in Christ, you are in Christ. No one can snatch you out of his hand. Not even yourself. Did you do anything to earn your salvation, Eric? No, I, I don't think you did. Richard, did you do anything to earn your salvation? Free gift. If it was up to you, Eric, would you keep it? Like it was up to your own power, like you gotta still be good to keep this salvation. How fat, how far do you think you would go before you lose it? It probably is a second or two. It's not up to us to earn our salvation. It's not even up to us to keep it. God keeps you. And he also promises that he will never cast you out. Okay. Theoretically, just because you're under a ban and your earthly life is snuffed out doesn't mean that, that your salvation is stripped away. So people could be saved, theoretically, and placed under this earthly consequential ban. This is God preserving the integrity of his people. Violating harem places you and your family under it. We'll see that with Achan. Tuck that away in the back of your mind. Okay, the meaning of harem as devoting. There's a positive and a negative aspect to this. Positively means devote or reserve for the exclusive use of God's purposes. He, he, he tells them this with Jericho's treasure. Okay, and this is also explained in Leviticus 27. Set this aside for my own use, God says. Harem this for me. That's the positive side. We can't touch it because we're setting it aside for God's uses. The negative aspect is destroy to prevent use for another purpose. Destroy these people so that their sins don't multiply in the land. Okay, so its real technical meaning is devoting. I can either devote it for happy reasons or devote it for sad reasons. But it's basically setting aside something for the exclusive use of a god or divine person. This concept was well understood in the ancient Near East. This isn't just this here. Okay. People got what's going on. Now, as we'll see with the Gibeonites, God held Israel to their vows, even when those vows would violate harem. This elevates the importance of vows to even above harem itself. We will see this when we get to the Gibeonites. Okay, not to spoil that one, but it's fascinating what happens there. Why do the Gibeonites pretend to be from a faraway land. We just read in Deuteronomy 20. Here's what you do to, to, to people outside the land. The Gibeonites somehow caught wind of that. Oh, let's pretend we're from... Oh, I can't wait to get it. It's fascinating what happens there. Uh, and, and they do. And Joshua enters into a vow, which from that point on makes it impossible to fully carry this out, but God holds them to that vow. Now, speaking of that vow, Remember, anyone that violates Haram is placed under it, him and his family. We'll see that with Achan. they got to take care of that problem first. Saul, King Saul. Oh, King Saul and his zeal. And our friend King Saul. Um, he wakes up one day and he realizes, oh, the Gibeonites are still here? Oh, that's a problem because I'm so zealous for God that I need to finish the job that our forefather Joshua didn't finish. So, hey, I'm going to get back in God's good graces. If I slaughter the, the, the Gibeonites because, hey, they're Canaanites. Man, I might be a hero. How does God respond to that? Um, this is 2 Samuel 21. Uh, Saul attacked the Gibeonites during his reign. I have this on the backside bullet point. This resulted in a blood guilt punishment of famine on Israel. When you're reading through this and you don't know this concept, you're coming across 2 Samuel 21 and you're like, God sends a famine on Israel? Why? David looks into this, and it's like, God, how do I solve this problem? Oh, you need to kill Saul's family. What? That doesn't sound like I'd like to think that God is the nice guy in the rocking chair in the sky. 
because Saul violated Haram by attacking the Gibeonites. And that reference is there in 2 Samuel 21. So David had to carry out Haram's punishment by wiping out Saul's family. That's what's going on there. Now i got to round up seven sons and kill them all. Now, it seems that God is satisfied when David eliminates seven of Saul's sons. That seems to be a sense of completion and perfection. God is satisfied with that. There's one son of Jonathan. There's one descendant of, of uh, Saul that David is very careful not to kill. And who's that? It's Mephibosheth, and why not? Because David already made an oath with Mephibosheth. You shall leave my table forever. You're going to be fine. If he would have killed Mephibosheth, he would have violated an oath he made that does have connection to the harem. Can you imagine David and his family being placed under harem? Um, That's a huge problem because who is to come from David? That's Jesus. David was so very careful righteous man that he was, to make sure he's following every detail of harem to its greatest extent. Now, we're running out of time. We didn't even get to all that I wanted to. Uh, read this over. Harem is not jihad, and harem is not commanded. For t- Nobody has the right to start slaughtering people today. That was for Joshua, for Israel, as they're taking over the promised land. I'll just leave you with this. I'll leave you with the bold claim this week. It's a two-parter bold claim first half of the bold claim. Now, I will take one more minute of time. Is this a hard topic? This is a very hard topic. You can imagine speaking with people about this, and it's just, it's it's emotional, it's visceral, but that's not who I've always thought God is. We have to learn who God is from the scripture, and he has reasons for doing all that he does. And the only reason that matters is because he wants to do something. But he also has very Reasonable reasons for doing everything he does. Two part bold claim. One, world history would have been a lot better if Israel would have finished the job. Bold claim. I'm just going to put it out there. They don't finish the job. That's the book of Judges. We'll get to see the litany of their failures. Two, bold claim. This is, this is me of how I understand weaving the harem concept through scriptures. It has ripple effects a lot more than we ever thought. It carries all the way through. My bold claim is that when Jesus comes back, he finishes the job. But he does it with the entire unbelieving world. To get ready for the kingdom in the promised land. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you and you are good. You are holy. Everything you do is good. Everything you do is holy. We don't always understand it. In fact, oftentimes we don't because we can't. Because, Father, you are God and we are not. Help us to humbly approach you in the scriptures. Give us wisdom and insight as to who you are and even as to why you do things, even though we don't always need to know. But help us to never escape the fact that you are good. You work all things together for good for those who love you and you will be glorified in all that you do. We thank you that you are good, and we thank you that you have left us with a revelation of who you are and how you want us to live. Help us to represent you well always, and to be great ministers of the gospel that you've entrusted to us to share with all. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.